um, you know, really just living intentionally in this neighborhood. Actually, I, I moved in this neighborhood with, with the intention of, of sharing the gospel with my life to yeah. people in this community. So. You know, I think there's a lot of people who either think because they go to church on Sundays that they are right with God. And there are a lot of people who, because they don't go to church, they think they are not right with God. So I, I think there are a lot of uh, people who are, are spiritually dead, but really they, they, they know some form of godliness, but I, the... I, I think there's just not an understanding of the gospel, of, of grace uh, that frees us to worship Jesus. And there's a lot of religion, I think, around here. And there's a very, um, it's, it's very rooted in this area here in particular. People just think that church is their faith, ultimately. And if, if I go to church Sunday, I'm right with God. If I don't go to church Sunday, I'm not right with God conversations with your neighbors is very meaningful and uh, not even um, I guess you know I, I, I come from a place where there was a lot of uh, service projects that you know attracted a lot of people and uh, there's there's this very attractional model bring people into a building and you know tell them about Jesus get them saved wait let the pastor do that job yeah um, it's, uh, I think there are a lot of people who come to Detroit with the, the realization, um, they address the reality of, of the brokenness and they try to do something creative or something positive to bring a, a good positive energy to the city. Um, but I think there's, and it's, it's a really good thing that's happening. There's, there's a lot of um, good economic development that's happening here, but it, usually ignoring the people that exist in the community already and I think there is a desperate cry from the people that the, the historic Detroiters um, that they they desperately need something and I think there's there are good movements that are happening here but really people need to be reconciled to God in order to change and so I think um, uh, addressing the brokenness of the city through the lens of the gospel and, and seeing this brokenness as something that only Jesus can repair. Broken family situations, um, you know, poor management of resources, poor management of homes, um, joblessness and entitlement, you know, there are a lot of things that I, I think, you know, obviously the gospel hits, hits all those things. And so really, um, living here, I, I want to address the problems of Detroit with the gospel, and not just something positive, some, you know, directing people to what is, what is good in Detroit. There are a lot of good things here. There are a lot of good things happening. Uh, really, I, I wasn't seeing the gospel for what it was. I, I think I was really trapped in a religious mindset of, um, if I'm not uh, doing, then I am not right with God. There was a lot of do, do this, do more, try harder, and uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of theology that I think had worked into me. And I think uh, really something I've seen is uh, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's the gospel. It's, it's Jesus Christ. It's what he did for me on the cross. It's what he did for believers. Um, and the work that he did, uh, ultimately, he, he obeyed the law. And because of what he did, I, I want to worship him. And that, that's, that's how I want my worship to, to flow from my life, is, is out of a grateful heart that desires to be obedient because of what Jesus did. And that affects my entire life and realizing that that affects my relationship with people and that affects how I view the city, that affects um, what I want to do with my life. Thanks, man. Yeah. Nice. Wait, one more thing. Uh, the reality is there are so many broken down buildings and, and homes that have just been abandoned and stripped of everything that is worth anything. 
uh, that they're beyond repair, they're beyond restoration. And I think it can, it can leave a really um, hopeless mentality in, in people if, if you don't see it through the way of, you know, God is working in the hearts of people here. Looking at Detroit from the outside, just kind of seeing images and what, what goes on the internet is recently getting a lot of negative buzz, it's called ruin porn, um, casts a really negative light on Detroit, but it, it is something that is a reality that has to be addressed. There, there is restoration that does need to be done. Um, and uh, I think I see it positively in that something will happen in these broken down places and, and something is happening that God is moving in the city and God is stirring up the hearts of people to address the brokenness and God is working in the midst of brokenness. Speaking to Austin and Stardust Clint and uh, they actually are an answer to prayer. I've been praying for God to send leaders uh, to join us on mission here at Restore and boom you guys show up I think at our uh, gospel racial reconciliation service and uh, we kind of uh, started walking together since then. We live over on John R. and I think it'd be really interesting for people to hear your perspective of what it's like to live in central Detroit. Why it's so different. We grew up on the other side of the state in a lot of cornfields. Both of our towns had one stoplight growing up. Just so. like John R. where you live, right? <laughs> Just like John R. We moved over. We really wanted to live in the city and originally we lived down in Midtown and that was a big step for us, even coming from where we grew up to there. And then after about a year and a half there, really felt a burden to kind of move more into where people were at. It was, it was different living downtown, but we still didn't have the ministry opportunities we were hoping to have by moving over. It's been pretty eye-opening as far as Detroit in general. And the stories that you hear, and the stories we hear growing up about Detroit on the other side of the state, they're really they're pretty accurate and true, which is, which is quite surprising. Well, the other day I was out out in our backyard and I, heard, I was with two little younger boys and I heard this huge boom, like a crash, and I was wondering what it was. So I went out to the side of the house and I looked and the lady, had her kid, her, her baby wasn't buckled and it was about to fall out of the window. And so she went to grab her baby and ran into someone else's car, like my neighbor's car, and completely like the bumpers all torn off and everything and she just stood around gave like a deer in the headlights look and sped off and then today one of the ladies that had saw it happen when we got her address and got it back and she was giving up the address for money because she said that she wanted crack and she really needed it and so she was like I'll, I'll give you the address I'll give you the information if you give me money so I can go go buy my stuff and things like that you see people are just really broken they don't they don't have any other options, I think, in their minds, that they, the drugs make them feel good. Mm. And then these, the, the little boys who come and hang out with me, they're in second or third grade and they can't read, they don't know basic math, they, they have all these stories about all the adults, what they're doing, what they're drinking. Like, I had a glass of cranberry juice and they asked me what it was and told me what their grandma drank all the time. And it was hard liquor and it's just... The kids are broken because they want role models or they don't have them. They are growing up and they can't read. And then people are just always asking for money and not being up front what they want the money about. Well, what they want the money for and then they talk to them. It's like they just want something they can forget about their pain, which is the drugs and move on. They go for runs and things and like you said, there's just churches all over the place. And a lot of them are older churches. Detroit's better years when there's more, a lot more people here. But when you go on a Sunday, a lot of them are empty. Even if you're out on a Sunday morning going for a run or something, there's still a lot of churches that are empty. And even the people that are there, it's it's just a culture thing to go. A lot of it's the the older folks that live around in the neighborhood. They've been here a while, and that's the church they were at. So they've been there. They take their grandkids sometimes, but it's just they get all dressed up drive to church and then that's it they kind of just leave the church there it doesn't really come home and it doesn't affect their their lives you can talk to people and 
they'll talk, they'll talk about how they go to church and how they they're involved there. Or even in the there's a lot of homeless ministries there. Out, um, churches have set up there and kitchens and things, and they'll they'll talk for hours about how much they serve there. But there's no gospel. It's they're just working because they're hoping that that's what's gonna help them. That's what's gonna bring them to Christ. But they they're missing the gospel. I would love to, where we, especially where we're at in the communities, are getting, we're getting to know our neighbors, and they're just deeply hurting, and I, I really believe that they see something different in us. Why would a white person move into a black community where there's gunshots every night, and there's a drug house behind us, and why would they come and just talk to us and want to be a neighbor? And I would love for for them to start asking more questions and you know, have my life open and be able to present the gospel and to be able to have people really know who Jesus was and to not just see him as a person that they like, maybe talk about on Sunday, but as someone who, who died for them and that they see that their brokenness and their sin and they just fall in love with Jesus and to completely just spread like a virus throughout the community. That would just, that would be incredible. He means everything. He's, he's the reason we're here. He's the reason we're married. He's the reason he's, he's the answer to what we're looking for, both in our own lives, for the people of Detroit. He is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. We can't feel less about with anything else. Uh, that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful, Austin. What you said started us. You want people to fall in love with Jesus, with Jesus, and that's because you two have fallen in love with Jesus and are falling in love with Jesus. So, um, your 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 life and your desire to reach our neighborhood is just an overflow of your relationship with Him. So you guys are a great blessing to us. You've definitely been an encouragement and answer to prayer and. We're really thankful that we can walk together in gospel mission in the 4202 or 206 and outward. The quote was, um, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. And uh, so for a guy who kind of talks a lot, um, he took that as actions speak louder than words. And Mike kind of gave uh, the opposite kind of take of that where it's kind of like if feed the hungry if necessary, use food. And it's like, okay, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> so that's kind of, um, just the thought of discipleship, the word itself is just so, so Jesus centered. And um, being a part of a community and a discipleship group is just a, an opportunity to grow more with the community and grow more to Christ, to be equipped more to, to lead other people to Christ and to, to lead them to, uh, to become disciples so that it would continue on because that's what called it, God called us to do. Wow, all right. And you've been coming out to the story. Yes. All five sessions. What did you thought about that? I think it's awesome. It actually reminded me of uh, Tim Keller's Reason for God. He, he kind of had um, a discussion group with people and uh, that's kind of how I felt about the story. You know, you talk about, we, we do sessions and you talk about different parts of the Bible in these segments and asking those questions and hearing what other people say kind of helps me understand what I've been reading in the Bible and kind of gives me a, a fresh perspective of what other people are struggling with or what their questions are and some of them are stuff that I struggle with and hearing other people um, have the same struggles, have the same questions kind of help me with realizing that I shouldn't be scared to ex ask questions and um, hearing other people's answers with that helped me to kind of equip me so that I could answer questions for other people that may be having the same questions that I did. Good. And, and actually connecting with the people there. I, I Birds, who is Jesus to you? What does he mean to you? quite cliche to say Jesus is my savior because he is, but everybody should see Jesus as a savior, as, as their savior. Um, he rescued me from going in the complete wrong direction of living for myself rather than living for his glory to serve people around me. Um, he came to us so that he could serve us, not to be served. So he really saved me from selfishness.
Mm-hmm. So are we hot? Yep. So I just want to start off and establish this right off the bat, Kenny. You've, uh, we've known you about a year, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe a little over a year. You've become a good friend. How often are you at our house? Very often. <laughs> if not every day. Every How many hundreds day. of pounds of food of ours have you eaten? Not a lot, because he doesn't like my cooking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just be real, like you always are. I thought, like, like all the city was be doing something good. We, you know, we get, you know, white families in the neighborhood. Because I heard downtown was supposed to be getting, you know, renovated and, and everything. So I thought the city was only come up. I heard you want to establish, you know, a church here in this, in this neighborhood you know, to help out the community because it's, it's terrible over here, you know. Somebody need, you know, I guess a higher force to look up to and help them out with their problems instead of going through the bad substances and chasing money all the time. Because you just feel like, oh my gosh, how could I, you know, how could how could I even begin to scratch the surface of what's going on? And, um, and then other days that it's like, um, there's just so much potential to see so much restoration. Um, I think, man, it's, I mean, there's a serious part of it, especially with your kids. I mean, they're, they're your responsibility, they're your kids, you know. I don't remember who it was who said it to you, but how naive it is to think that God might have an adventure for you and not for your children. And so I think the temptation is to say, no, I want to keep them so safe and I want to keep them in this bubble and, you know, I don't, I don't want them to see anything or experience anything that might hurt them or, you know. But I think that's putting God in a pretty small box. And, uh, and that's, you know, and it's just, it's, it's hard. I mean, it, it literally feels like there are days where with our kids, you're just kind of holding them up and going, okay, I've got... Like, Which is the gospel, right? So it's like, if you're doing, if, you know, if you're doing things compelled by grace that you've experienced and you try and like the father who went like this with his boy. When it comes to schools, it's we're looking at a variety of things, and it's different for each of our kids. Um, not all of our kids are biological, and so some of them um, have had experiences that they need to be a little bit more protected um, than the other ones. So it's connected to that, but just the breakdown of the family. You know, I mean, it's just, I think um, our daughter was in a class of second graders, um, 27 kids in the class, and only three of the 27 kids were living with a biological parent. Hmm. 24 out of 27 were with a foster parent, a grandma, an auntie, an um, adoptive parent, and I mean, those odds are, like, what do you do with that? You know, there's no sense of stability for kids. Um, and so, like that, I don't know, that's just that's a symptom of, of so much of the brokenness. And so I think, you know, in that, it's like relationships so that people, when they're trying to, to get things right or, to, you know, that they, they have a way to call out for help. And, um, I don't know. Back to Detroit, it has been real experience. My one word for Detroit right now is really. Uh, everything is really, really funny. The taxes are high, the homes are abandoned, they have a lot of blight. But recently I moved back into Boston Edison neighborhood and I've let, met a lot of nice people in our neighborhood. I've met the Hannafees and I've met the, uh, what's your name? <laughs> I've met Ruth and, um, Cletus, and they've been very nice people, and I love him. That's my sweetheart right there. So it's been really different. You know, I like that it's becoming a diverse community. A lot of nice people running around, a lot of kids, because when I first moved here, there were no kids, but you know, all in all, it's been a great experience so far. <laughs> I haven't really taught them as much as they taught me. Um, they taught me unity, they, um, you know, open their homes and they we fellowship and they become like a second family to me. You know, it's no, I don't look at them as being me black and them white, I just look at people as being people. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's a lot of white people in invading our neighborhood. Well, to me, it's not white people, they're people. And that's what they've taught me because they've actually unified the neighborhood a lot more than it was. I grew up over here, so I know that this area was always 
like separate. But now they kind of joined a lot of different families and they've got a lot of fellowship going on, which is a different type of thing where neighbors actually know neighbors. I would say they actually have to come to Detroit and experience Detroit as it is. Sitting on the outside 500 miles away is like judging any other city, you know what I'm saying? Unless you come here and you actually experience it for yourself, you can only imagine what it's like. Yeah, every city has crime, every city has, you know, homes that are bad and the streets are bad, there are rats and roaches and this and that going on. But it's no different than any other urban city. The only reason why Detroit gets such a bad rap is because before now it was predominantly black. And we had crime and they, they focused on that crime. But, I mean, show me a place that doesn't have crime. It just centralized. It's just like the lady that got killed in Gross Point. She didn't really get killed in Detroit. But because they brought her body into Detroit and dropped her off on the east side, Detroit takes the bad rap for that. And that's what a lot of this is going around. I mean, if you go to West Bloomfield, they have just as much crime in West Bloomfield. But when they come on the news, they, the first thing they say is Detroit suburb. They don't say West Bloomfield. They always say Detroit suburb. So everybody goes, oh, that's Detroit. Oh, they got some bad people up in there. But really, if they come here, they will actually see that there are a lot of things to do. There are actually good school. There are actually good kids. There are actually good people. There are jobs. It's just, you know, that we've taken a struggle because we were an urban community. It's going to be just like any other city, like in D.C., in Chicago, how they changed the whole city around and the nice communities and everything changed. That's the same thing that's going through Detroit right now. We're just waiting on the revitalization to go. It's going to be weather. I mean, I love Detroit. I was born and raised in Detroit. I moved away. I came back because this is the only place that's home to me. Irregardless to what's going on around here, I'm sorry, people, but I think they have crime everywhere. So, I mean, I could go to Washington, D.C. right now and probably get mugged, just like I can get mugged in Detroit. So don't make it, don't sit your, you know, say that Detroit is such a bad place because it's not a bad place. You have to actually come here and experience it and do some of the things and the cultural things that we have to offer because we do have a lot to offer other than crime.